Good morning. morning. Welcome everyone to Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran Church. Our order of service today is going to be found printed in your service bulletin. It is the uh, supplemental hymnal version of our baptismal rites. Some of you may be familiar with it. But we celebrate today the uh, baptism of uh, of Lucas Patrick Nash. And so our order of service, you will need it for the, uh, for the liturgy and the singing of the first hymn. We ask that our Lord would richly bless our worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Surely we were sinful at birth, sinful from the time our mothers conceived us. baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me.
Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Receive the sign of the cross both upon the head and upon the heart to mark you as a redeemed child of Christ. Lucas, Patrick, Nash, I baptize you in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. The Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has forgiven you all your sins. By your baptism you are born again and made a dear child of your Father in heaven. May God strengthen you to live in your baptismal grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. The assembly may please stand at this time. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord commands that we teach his precious truths to all who are baptized. Christian love therefore urges all of us, especially parents and sponsors, to assist in whatever manner possible so that Lucas may remain a child of God until death. If you are willing to carry out this responsibility, then answer yes, as God gives me strength. Yes, as God gives me strength. Let us pray. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of baptism by which you offer and grant the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Help us to regard our baptism as the robe of righteousness we are to wear all the days of our life. Look with special favor on Lucas and grant him a rich measure of your spirit that he may grow in faith and godly living. Make us willing to carry out our responsibilities to those who have been baptized, so that all of us may finally come to the blessed joys of heaven. Through Jesus our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God and Savior, you have set the final day and hour when we shall be delivered from this world of sin and death. Keep us ever watchful for the coming of your Son, that we may sit with him and all your holy ones at the marriage feast in heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and now. Please be seated as we hear the word of God. Our Old Testament lesson is recorded for us today in the book of Deuteronomy, reading from the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or your daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Remember 
You were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Here ends our Old Testament lesson. We continue with the psalm of the day, which is Psalm 118. It's found on page 108 in front of your hymnal. We'll sing the psalm responsibly by the half verse, and we'll join together in the refrain, and the glory be. gospel of our Lord, let us please stand. The gospel that is chosen for the third Sunday after Pentecost is recorded for us in St. Mark's gospel account, reading from the seventh chapter, beginning at verse 1. Glory be to you, O Lord. Glory be Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus 
and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. This is the gospel of our Lord. you to join with me in our common confession of faith as it is printed out in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from the Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our lesson for consideration today is recorded for us in the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, reading from the second chapter, verses 13 through 17. And I will read the text momentarily. Please be seated. In the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ, dear Christian friends, if you are a theme person for sermons, you may have noticed in the service bulletin today an odd word. Now some of you are looking. It is a Greek word, and it makes no more sense in the Greek than it does in the English when it comes to themes because it doesn't really say a whole lot. It's the Greek conjunction that is translated therefore. Now, what in the world does therefore have to do with any kind of a theme? It doesn't tell you much, but it becomes a critical point of Paul's text. Because just like in the English language, when we say therefore, we are wrapping up some very important thoughts. We might say concluding thoughts. Because this has happened here, therefore, don't let this happen to you over here. And that's what Paul does in our text today. It's a critical word that connects two thoughts, wraps it all up. Listen for it as I read the text to you today. Colossians 2, beginning at verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, catch it, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Therefore, in Jesus' day, the traditions the rituals, some of which were prescribed by God, like the Sabbath day, they were becoming obscured by the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And when the rituals were becoming obscured, a vacuum was created for the people of God, the Jewish people, the Israelites. And guess what was replaced in that vacuum? the traditions of men. And people were clinging to the traditions of men, hoping that this would somehow influence their character before God. In other words, if I make it to Sabbath at the synagogue as a weekly routine, if I have my eight-day-old boy circumcised, if I make it out to Passover and the Day of Atonement, if I do these things, perhaps God will look upon my character as a son of Abraham, as a child of Moses, as a keeper of the law, and have mercy on me in the end. And all of those promises that foretold a crucified Christ that was going to come and bear their sin, all of it was obscured. They were more concerned about how many steps a man took carrying his mat on the Sabbath day than they were to understand what the Sabbath meant. It was a day of rest. They were more concerned with the fulfillment of a ritual than they were in the understanding of the ritual. And guess what? Christ was lost. And so here we are today, in 2015. The visible church is 
what, 2.3 billion people worldwide, which transcends denominational barriers. This is just the sum total that have aligned themselves in some form or fashion with the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. In other words, if someone puts a gun to your head and says, tell me who it is you believe in, 2.3 billion people in this world today would say, well, Jesus, okay? That's all that this means. This outward form of the church called the visible church, if Jesus were to come today and scrutinize and judge and evaluate this visible entity of the church today, would he find anything different than what he found in his day? Jesus said Isaiah the prophet was right when he spoke about you hypocrites. You have an outward religious veneer, but you have hollow philosophies therein. You do not teach the ways of God, you teach the ways of man. You use ordinances of God to your own purpose and for your own greedy sake. Have you ever yawned your way through worship? Have you ever prayed the Lord's Prayer and not really paid attention to the petitions therein? Have you ever brought someone to be baptized and never really paid attention to what baptism does? Is it important to you that your child gets married in the church because you got married in the church and your grandparents got married in the church? What do the externals of the church look like today? Why do you even gather? Do you have a love for God's word or do you have a outward form of love that really isn't about being guided by that word but rather just wants an external form and attachment to that word. And so when the time comes to grow in faith in God's word, you walk yourself right by opportunities because truth be told, when push comes to shove, you really don't know, want to know what the word says. After all, it might be saying things about your life that need some correction. Pretty sure Jesus would look at the church today, the outward form of the church today, and evaluate it the same way he did in his day. A whole lot of hypocrisy. Remember when Jesus stood across the temple and he told his disciples, do you see these people putting money? See, they didn't pass a collection plate at synagogue. They had a big secure box outside of the temple grounds where people would come and bring their offerings in. You remember what Jesus said? He told his disciples, do you see all these people putting their money in? With the exception of one widow, one person. Jesus said, all these people are giving to God out of their wealth. Isaiah was right. These people worship me with their lips. There's a lot of hot air coming out, but there's no heart. There's no heart in it. Why do you gather as Christians? Why do you bring a child to baptism? Why do you send them through confirmation? People are scratching their heads today and saying, why is there a mass exodus of teenage children going the way of secular world? Why are more people today approving of gay marriage in the Christian community and approving of abortion and all of the other morals that are clearly outlined as God forbid in Scripture because they're not taking the time to read and study the Scriptures? You are the guardian of those Scriptures, but that doesn't mean you're to guard your children from those Scriptures. And so what we see taking place today is we send our children off to the church for an hour, an hour and a half a week, and then we send them off to these secular schools for 35 hours a week. Guess who's winning the battle? And you say, well, the secular schools, they're not a religious entity. We have a separation of church and state. Right, <laughs> right. Do you think they're not teaching your child about human sexuality? You think they're not teaching your child about the origin of life and that they came from monkeys? 
You think they're not teaching you about pluralistic society that we live in and that all religions are okay? Is that what Jesus said? All religions are okay? In John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus did not preach tolerance. Why should his church? And yet we send them off, and we wonder why they're leaving. You are the guardians of those scriptures. You are to teach them the ways of God. We are merely auxiliary in the church. Help fill in some gaps along the way. Sadly, sadly today, what so oftentimes happens is the same thing in Jesus' day. The vacuum, when God's word gets removed, be it from a church, Christian church, or be it from a family of God, people of God, what happens is, is they start to rely on themselves, on the outward form, on the character of an individual. And how many people haven't we talked to who think that somehow God's going to judge us based on the character of the individual? There are so many today in the Christian church who think that if they just keep their nose clean, they don't tell you how clean, but if they just keep it clean, that somehow God's going to have mercy on them. Tell that to the thief on the cross nine dying next to Jesus or the woman at the well who had five failed marriages and the man she was currently living with was not her husband. Tell that to Zacchaeus, the cheat, the tax collector. Tell that to the woman who was thrown at Jesus' feet when the Jewish people wanted her stoned to death. Did they have a religious veneer? Did, they, did Jesus save them based on their character? Certainly not. But that's what always is the consequence to losing the word of God. Somehow we reinvent the justice system of God and say that, well, as long as I am a pretty good person, get to church, throw a few coins in the coffer, as long as I'm doing what my parents and grandparents and great-grandparents did, I should be okay because there are plenty of other people in society for God to pick on than me. That's an invented justice system, not what Scripture teaches at all. Let's look again what Paul says because he doesn't even hint at a religion of character to save or forgive you and me. Look at what he says. This is leading up to his big therefore. Paul writes, when you were dead in your sins, now when were you dead in your sins? Well, when you became a fertilized egg. At Psalm 51, verse 5, King David said, In sin doth my mother conceive me. You inherited the guilt of your first parents, and your first parents weren't gorillas. Your first parents were Adam and Eve in a real garden of Eden, and you inherited their guilt without doing anything. And I know you're thinking to yourself, that's not fair. What kind of justice system is that? How do I get the guilt of Adam and Eve? How do I inherit someone else's guilt? How is that a fair justice system? I didn't ask to be a fertilized egg. I didn't ask to be conceived. I didn't ask to come into this world. My parents brought me into this world. Why do I inherit their guilt? And that's a great question. You should ask God when you die. It's what the Bible teaches, though. You were dead the moment you were conceived, spiritually. And your death reveals itself throughout life in actual sins, doesn't it? You're not guilt-free. I'm not guilt-free. But notice what God says. The Apostle Paul says, when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. You didn't make yourself alive either. See, this is where we get to the goodness of our God, the benevolence of our merciful God who is gracious and loving to people who don't deserve that love. While you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. Now, when did he do that? At baptism. The world looks at water connected with God's word and they scoff at the church. How can water and the word bring about a rebirth? Again, you've got to ask God that. It's just what his word teaches us. Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so we rely on Christian baptism for forgiveness because in baptism, God imputes Christ to us. We recognize the flaws of our own ways and when we have a child, that child is born in sin and death and so we, by God's grace, bring that child to the font to receive reconciliation 
to receive all of Christ in baptism. While you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He goes on. Paul says he forgave us all of our sins. Now, this is a really, really important part because a lot of people would like to think that God only forgives you once in a while or for some of the sins. And then we start carrying around this guilt in our life. Well, he possibly couldn't forgive me for these sins. Well, the text says he forgave us all of our sins. Now, you have to ask yourself, how does that make God a just God? How can he just, does he snap his fingers? Does he look away or like the old grandpa up in heaven, does he stroke his white beard and say, oh, these, these, these poor little mortals, they did it again, and he chuckles at our sins? Is that justice? No. How does he forgive our sins? Well, Paul's going to tell us. He's going to put them on another person. This is just such an incredible text here. It is so beautiful. If this is all you knew in God's word, you'd be okay. This is such a beautiful text because the Apostle Paul says what he did with your sins. He says, having canceled the written code, which is really not a great translation. The word for canceled there in the Greek, actually, I mean, canceled is not a bad word, but, you know, sometimes when we use computer keys, we cancel something, but then it comes back up. The, the word that's used here in the Greek for canceled is the word blotted out. Some of you who are older than the age of 40 know that when we used to use typewriters, we had to blot out mistakes and then use that same paper, run it back through, and then type over it. We couldn't use delete buttons or cancel buttons like we can today. Well, that's the word that Paul has in mind when he says he canceled, he blotted out, he erased it. It's never going to be called up against you. Now, what is this written code that he canceled? the written code of the law, the Ten Commandments. He canceled them. Now you ask yourself, how does that make God just if God just cancels the law? I mean, if we had a judge sitting downtown uh, telling pedophiles and murderers, hey, I'm canceling the law. It's no longer going to be used against you. That's not justice, is it? How can God remain just and still blot out the law that condemns you and me? He tells us. He nails it to the tree. Not the actual law, but a person, his own son. You see, when Jesus came to this earth, his mission first and foremost was to remain sinless. The devil knew this, which is why right after Jesus' baptism, where does the Spirit of God lead our blessed Lord Jesus Christ out into the wilderness. For 40 days and 40 nights, the devil tried to get the Son of God to succumb. If, if you bow down to me, if you do like the rest of the secular world and fall prey to the sin of humanism and secularism, I'll give you the whole splendor of the world. And I've got a pretty good world, the devil said. Look at it. It's great. Jesus said it is written, Worship and serve the Lord your God only. Well, then at least turn these stones into bread. You've got to be hungry out here. You've got the power to do so. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Temptation after temptation, temptations that you and I have fallen prey to countless times in our life, our representative, our substitute. The Lord Jesus Christ never once sinned. That was mission accomplished number one. In John's gospel, Jesus challenged the religious leaders and said, who of you can charge me of sin? Nobody could because he never once sinned, not in thought, word, or deed. And then, he takes this fulfillment of the law, his perfect life, and he goes to Jerusalem to die. But here's the best part of our text. You see, the devil is not all-knowing. He's not omniscient like our God is. And I don't think he knew that the cross would be the instrument of man's salvation and forgiveness. And so, if he couldn't get Jesus to fall prey to sin, the next best thing was, well, let's get the people of the world to reject him. Well, that wasn't too hard, was it? He filled one of his own disciples, Judas Iscariot, that greedy man whom the Bible says used to help himself to the money bag at his own leisure. He filled his heart, Satan did, and got him to betray the Son of God for 30 pieces of silver. Okay, he's got one of his own gone. 
Then he gets the religious leaders to put him on trial. Do you remember that when they spit in his face? And they said, you have the prince of demons living in your heart. Satan is thinking, yes, this is going as planned. Man is rejecting God's son. Turns him over to the Gentiles and the Roman governor who didn't want to crucify him. He whipped him and whipped him and whipped him, scourged and ripped open his flesh. Satan and the whole prince of demons, they are now laughing hysterically. They finally are getting what they desire, but what they don't realize is God had this plan set in motion a long time ago. Then they pierce him on that tree. Remember when darkness hovered over the earth in the middle of the afternoon, one of those miracles of God? That was the hell that the Son of God suffered. Darkness represents death and hell. And that's when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, bearing the sins of the entire world of Adam and Eve all the way to you and me, bearing all those sins, feels the forsakenness of his Father. Darkness comes over the earth. The Father turns his back on his Son. And you can bet that the devil was now laughing and jeering. Finally, I get the victory I've coveted all along. But now look at our text today. What happens? Paul writes, having disarmed the powers and authorities, this is not the Roman government that we're speaking of. This is the powers and authorities of the underworld. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. There are two accounts in the entire New Testament that speak about Jesus' descent into hell. This is one of them. The other one Peter speaks of in his epistle. And in this account, like we said in the Apostles' Creed, we believe that Jesus died, he descended into hell, and on the third day rose from the dead. What was Jesus doing down in hell? Some speculate and say, well, he was still suffering the punishment of God. No, he wasn't. That punishment came to an end when he declared it is finished. When he gave up his life, the sins of the entire world were paid in full. And now it was time to celebrate. So what does he go do? He descends into the dark, deep abyss of hell itself and says, I am the victor over death. I am the victor over sin. You have to let go of these people because I have destroyed you. I never once sinned and I have given up my life as a sacrifice for them. And God was well pleased with that sacrifice. On the third day, the Son of God rose triumphantly from the dead and declared his victory over sin, Satan, death, and hell. But it wasn't his victory alone. Ever been to a funeral? It's their victory too. So long as they confess the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's their victory too because Jesus won it for us all. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, since sin is paid in full, since the devil's been destroyed, since death is swallowed up in victory, therefore, don't let any man or woman or child tell you, judge you, bring externals into your life to take your eyes off of the prize in Christ because only in Christ are we forgiven and saved. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding may it guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus. Amen. We now join in the singing of the Create in Me. It's found on, it's hymn 272. Hymn 272.
please be seated as we gather our gifts for the service of our Savior. Merciful Father, though you are exalted over heaven and earth, nevertheless you have mercy and compassion upon the lowly. Therefore we come to you confidently with all our needs, trusting you to supply them. We come to you for food, clothing, shelter, good health, steady employment, protection, and all other things that we require. Because we still have our sinful flesh, we confess we are in danger of desiring more than is sufficient and of striving for things that are not, are not good for us. We therefore leave the final selection of all our earthly blessings to your wisdom and holy will. We ask that you would especially watch over the elderly among us, the widows, the fatherless, the injured and infirm, the disabled, the poor, the downcast, and the oppressed. Supply them according to their several needs. Oh, forgive our sins, merciful Father. Especially forgive all those times when we, your children, complained about our lot in life and forgot your many blessings. Forgive all those times we were dissatisfied and wanted more than was sufficient for us. Forgive all those times we did not share our abundance with those in need. Forgive all those times we neglected to thank and praise your holy name. Forgive us for Jesus' sake. Lead our entire nation to repentance that it may escape your wrath and displeasure. Heavenly Father, we are but strangers and pilgrims here on earth. 
but you have promised us everlasting life in heaven through your dear Son. Therefore, through the Holy Spirit, feed our souls on Christ, who is the true bread of life. Make the gospel of Christ the joy of our hearts, and through it, increase our faith and strengthen our hold on eternal life. Father, we know that you have forgiven all our sins and supplied all our needs. Therefore, unto you we raise our voices in praise and prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We continue now with the order of the sacrament as it's found on page 21. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body given for you for the remission of all your sins in the same manner then after the supper he also took the cup he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying drink of it all of you this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you for the remission of all your sins do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me the peace of the Lord be with you always At the direction of the ushers, those who have examined themselves and are in fellowship with the teachings of our church body may now come forward. For those of you who are new and are from other wells or else churches, we do offer the common cup. It'll come after the individual cup. Also, we do have the um, gluten-free wafers, and if you need one, just tug on us, and we'll uh, see to it that you get one. We'll sing the two distribution hymns, 303 and 309. 